Hi everyone, my name is Ashikur Rahman. I'm a PhD student in mechanical engineering at the University of Texas at El Paso. Also, I'm a research assistant at Aerospace Center at UTEP. We are located in El Paso, Texas. UTEP's Aerospace Center is a NASA-funded center of excellence in aerospace and exploration. We perform different kinds of scientific research in different sectors such as space propulsion, combustion in energy sector, unmanned aerial systems, small satellites development, etc. We perform a wide range of research on small satellites. Our first satellite was deployed into the low Earth orbit to demonstrate in-space additive manufacturing experiment. Today I'll talk about one of our future small satellite missions known as Orbital Factory 4 which will be deployed to the geostationary transfer orbit. We are performing the preliminary research at this moment from which we will move forward to the satellite development. The name of our GTO satellite mission is Orbital Factory 4. GTO has not been a popular destination for CubeSat operations due to the lack of power, communication, and control capability. Because GTO is a highly elliptical orbit with a very high apogee, the majority of the satellite's lifetime is spent at high altitudes. The large distances during the apogee passes combined with limited CubeSat power present significant challenges for establishing a reliable link. This work is being performed to introduce a reliable CubeSat communication method from Apogee of the GTO orbit. Another challenge of the GTO mission is the detrimental effect of high radiation doses on electronics from multiple passages through the Van Allen radiation belts. Therefore, a secondary mission objective of OF4 is to measure the radiation environment experienced by CubeSat components in a GTO orbit which will enhance space environment knowledge applicable to future small satellite missions outside of low Earth orbit. Originally, our previous satellite Orbital Factory 2 was intended to launch on a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket into a geostationary transfer orbit. However, due to limited GTO launch availability, it was decided to launch our prior satellite into a low Earth orbit and the GTO mission shall be manifested sometime in next few years and will be launched with one of ULA's launch vehicle. To develop estimated orbital parameters for analysis, the Keplerian elements of prior ULA Atlas center stages that were disposed in GTO were analyzed. We are planning to develop a 3U structure with PC-104 form factor and system bus which allows modules to be stacked and routed easily. Potential satellite bus system shall include onboard computer, UHF and S-band transceivers, electrical power system, microcat arc thrusters for attitude adjustments and orbital maneuvering, different types of sensors to explore space environment and cameras for nice pictures. The Orbital Factory 4 intends to demonstrate S-band communication capability with ground station utilizing the high apogee passes. It occurs nearly 90% of the total orbital period. Automatic adjustment of communication parameters shall be implemented to facilitate this long distance communication. Through our analysis, we propose to use a 6 watt transmitter and a 6 dB directional antenna with pointing accuracy of 5 degrees which can provide a received power of negative 125 decibel milliwatt at receiver end from around 36,000 km distance. According to the STK simulation, OF4 in GTO will tend to only pass over the ground station twice per day at perigee where high data rate can be achieved up, up to 1 Mbps. For apogee passes, data rates will be reduced to 600 bit per second to ensure a reliable link as we have seen negligible error rates which indicates that signal can be reconstructed at the ground end without getting too much error. By implementing these parameters, we are expecting to gain full control over the satellite throughout the entire orbital period. As we know, GTO is a highly elliptical orbit with a very high apogee. The majority of the satellite's lifetime is spent at high altitudes. Though the orbital period for GTO is approximately 11 to 12 hours, only an hour or less of each orbit is spent in the LEO region close to perigee, where communication with the satellite has the least difficulty. Through this low perigee passes, we are targeting to get 1 Mbps of data rates with which bulk amount of data can be received. Here the picture shows the simulated orbital trajectory of OF4. 
From this analysis, we have observed passes occurring every other orbit per day, approximately 11 hours apart. There are 49 accesses from high apogee observed within a one month period with a minimum of 30 minutes and a maximum of 10 hours approximately. The most dangerous aspect of a GTO mission is the passage through the Van Allen radiation belts. The Van Allen belt consists of electrons, protons, and uh, trapped particles by the Earth's magnetic field. The belts are dangerous as the radiation from these trapped particles is detrimental to electronics. Radiation is hazardous to electronics as it can degrade the electrical components as well as cause single event effects. The single event upsets usually cause bit flips, single event latch up causes an abnormally high operating current, single event burnout damages the, the transistor permanently. To estimate the radiation dosage from the belts, the space environment and effect tools from the STK was used. This tool models the Earth's magnetic field and uses NASA developed model to calculate radiation dosage over time. For our analysis, total dosage was monitored for different aluminum shielding thicknesses. Radiation rate is particularly high in the inner Van Allen belt for 2 to 3 mm of shielding, though it decreases to lower for 4 mm or thicker shielding. The radiation shielding is ineffective against heavier or more energetic particles such as galactic cosmic rays and also ineffective at preventing single event upsets. But it can dramatically increase hardware lifetime if used properly. In order to prevent the single event effect, some other strategies shall be followed, such as 3 mm of titanium shielding shall be implemented, gallium arsenide circuits shall be used to mitigate the risk of latch up and burnout, and also device immunity shall be ensured by using uh, components with linear energy transfer threshold greater than 100 mega electron volt centimeter square per milligram. An analysis was performed using MATLAB and STK to characterize the solar power generated while OF4 is in orbit. The STK solar panel tool was used to calculate the solar power generated over one month period. The solar panel tool measures this by using a CAD model of the potential solar cells which will be used with OF4. Combining the power generated from all solar cells located at five sides of the satellite, we are estimating at least 65 watt hour of energy can be produced per orbit. Power consumption statistics shows for nominal use of all CubeSat components, 55 watt hour can be consumed over each orbit. So it is reasonable to rely on solar power for regular satellite activity. However, during the eclipse, we need to rely on the battery power. It has been estimated that approximately 35% battery discharge will occur during that period. Then it will take three to four hours to charge it again fully when we get out of the eclipse. Upon leaving the deployer, CubeSats frequently experience steep off, which will cause random tumbling. Tumbling can be a problem if a CubeSat requires fine pointing control. Satellites in low Earth orbit have the advantage of using magnetorquers, which can produce a torque using the Earth's magnetic field for detumbling and attitude control. The magnetorquers can also be used with satellites in GTO, but only if the perigee is within the low Earth orbit, which is the only region where the magnetorquers will be effective. The attitude simulations performed through STK shows the satellite can be detumbled to 0.41 degrees from an assumed initial condition of 5.1 degrees in 24 hours using two near-Earth passes where high magnetic field intensities are available. Once the satellite stabilization is complete, further attitude disturbances shall be corrected using onboard reaction wheels to keep the satellite narrow axis pointed to the Earth with a maximum allowable offset of 7 degrees from the ground antenna. Simulations of orbital trajectory and communication windows with STK have been used to develop a basic concept of operation, where an initial list of critical functions and actions have been planned to perform. The entire mission has been divided into five phases where, in first phase, launch and deployment, system activation, and first communication attempts are made. In second phase, orbital uh, attitude stabilization has been planned to be executed using onboard actuators. In third phase, 
OF4 will send housekeeping and image data over S band at Apogee once sufficient battery power is confirmed. In fourth phase, satellite will measure the total ionizing dosage and send data from Apogee, which will be which will be studied for research purposes. Phase five is the tentative extended mission uh, will be performed once all primary objectives are acquired by command uplink from the art station. In order to generate a basic concept of operation, prior launch, deployment, and mission timeline of ULA launches have been analyzed. These conops may change, and we have to update the conops with the new information as the development progresses. The probable launch site is Cape Carnival Air Force Station. The launch state and launch vehicle are still unknown. OF-4 will be powered off during all launch phases. Then in 105 minutes after launch primary uh, spacecraft separation occurs at approximately 9,000 km altitude. No satellite activity is still at this point. Then in 210 minutes, the CubeSats are deployed from the aft bulkhead carrier at approximately 29,000 km altitude. The EPS will be turned off for 30 minutes after deployment. Then after 30 minutes, the EPS initialization starts. There are three main operating modes that we'll be setting up. Standby mode, orientation mode, and the active mode. The satellite will remain in the standby mode in first seven hours after deployment. In the standby mode, only essential tasks shall be performed, such as system checkout, battery charging, recording data from different sensors. After eight hours, the satellite shall be approaching perigee, where magnetorca detumbling shall be performed and first UHF communication will be made. Once the satellite orientation is complete and the system is ready for S-band communication, the satellite will go into the active mode. During this mode, the satellite will be in the normal operating condition. The disturbance torques will be minimized using onboard actuators. The surface charge monitoring will be performed every hour and all data will be logged. Power and battery status will be monitored in the background. If at any point battery is discharged by 60%, the satellite will again go to the standby mode. During the extended mission, the satellite will constantly perform few assigned tasks at a suitable condition. At the background, power orientation, temperature and radiation status shall be monitored. If all conditions are satisfactory, satellite remains in the active mode where it will take one photo every two hours, read data from all sensors, and write it to the memory. It will also look for single event effects and all housekeeping data shall be transmitted over S-band and UHF. For the low power condition, satellite will go into the standby mode and for misalignment, the satellite will re-enter into the orientation mode. Our mission success criteria is to establish two-way S-band communication with the UTEP Aerospace Center ground station from Apogee. We will also measure long-term radiation effects on small satellite due to electrons and protons in GTO. We will also transmit and receive pictures obtained at GTO orbit and ensure satellite survival in GTO as long as possible. As I said before, our mission has not manifested yet. We are targeting to develop the satellite in the next couple of years. The future works are gathering um, the stakeholder requirements and develop in-house design, uh, fabrication and testing methods for the satellite also, we will test and validate satellite performance. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you everyone for watching this video. We have been scheduled to participate at the CubeSat Developers Workshop on April 29th, Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific time for live question and answer. I will be attending the session to answer any question you might have. And our sincere thanks to CubeSat Developers Workshop team for giving us the opportunity to present our work and we hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Thank you.